All right, open up to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 53 through 72. This will take us to the end of the chapter. And a message I've entitled, All Alone. You ever felt alone? You ever felt like nobody was there with you? Isolated? Who was United States Senator Edmund G. Ross of Kansas? Anybody heard of this guy? I suppose you could call him Mr. Nobody. No law bears his name. Not a single list of Senate greats mention his service. Yet when Ross entered the Senate in 1866, he was considered the man to watch. He seemed destined to surpass his colleagues, but he tossed it all away by one courageous act of conscience. Conflict was dividing our government in the wake of the Civil War. President Andrew Johnson was determined to follow Lincoln's policy of reconciliation towards the defeated South. Congress, however, wanted to rule the downtrodden Confederate states with an iron hand. Congress decided to strike first. Shortly after Senator Ross was seated, the Senate introduced impeachment proceedings against the hated president. The radicals calculated that they needed 36 votes and smiled as they concluded that the 36th was none other than Ross. The new senator listened to the vigilante talk, but to the surprise of many, he declared that the president deserved a fair trial as any accused man has ever had on earth. The word immediately went out that his vote was shaky. Ross received an avalanche of anti-Johnson telegrams from every section of the country. Radical senators badgered him to come to his senses. The fateful day of the vote arrived. The courtroom galleries were packed. Tickets for admission were at an enormous premium. As the death-like stillness fell over the Senate chamber, the vote began. By the time they reached Ross, 24 guilties had been announced. 11 more were certain. Only Ross's vote was needed to impeach the president. Unable to conceal his emotion, the chief justice asked in a trembling voice, Mr. Senator Ross, how vote you? This is the respondent, Andrew Johnson, guilty as charged. Ross later explained at the moment, I looked into my open grave, friendships, position, fortune, and everything that makes life desirable to an, ambitious, to an ambitious man were about to be swept away beneath in the breath of my mouth, perhaps forever. Then the answer came, unhesitating, unmistakable, not guilty. And with that, the trial was over, and the response was as predicted. A high public official from Kansas wired Ross to say, Kansas repudiates you and all she does, perjurers and stinks. The open gray vision had become a reality. Ross's political career was in ruins. Extreme ostracism and even physical attack awaited his family upon their return home. One gloomy day, Ross turned to his faithful wife and said, millions cursing me today will bless me tomorrow though not but God can know the struggle it has cost me. It was a prophetic declaration. Twenty years later, Congress and the Supreme Court verified the wisdom of his position and changed the laws relating to impeachment. Ross was appointed territorial governor of New Mexico. Then just prior to his death, he was awarded a special pension by Congress. The press and country took this opportunity to honor his courage, which they finally concluded had saved our country from crisis and division. Standing alone takes such courage. And few of us have the gumption to go through it. But for some of us, we have been through those times when we were all alone. And the world is watching. What are you going to do? How will you decide? 
What is your choice? Knowing that whatever you choose is going to reverberate through countless people for all time. If you've ever been in a situation like that, you understand the emotion that goes behind that. You understand how difficult it is to endure time like that. And if you understand what that's like, you understand what our Lord Jesus is about to go through all alone as he begins the trials before the Sanhedrin, before the chief priests, before Pilate, before so many people. He's going to stand before all of these people all alone. And he knows that whatever happens is going to reverberate for millions of people for all of time. And he has to do it all by himself. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, all alone stood trial several times. And as we continue this march towards his death, we will see him standing accused for the first time before the chief priests in the Sanhedrin. Mark chapter 53, or chapter 14, verses 53 through 72, goes something like this. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witnesses against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and when she, when she saw Peter warming himself, she said to, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them, for you are a Gal Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. God today wants you to see Jesus alone. He's all alone. As we see Jesus all alone, we see him in three different ways. The first way, verses 53 through 62, we see Jesus delivered. He's delivered all alone to the Sanhedrin, to the chief priests. Second way, verses 63 through 65, we see Jesus disgraced. It's not bad enough that they deliver him up to be held on trial, but he's also disgraced. And then in verses 66 through 72, we see Jesus denied. Jesus is delivered, Jesus is disgraced, and Jesus is denied. And he's all alone. It's got to be one of the most terrible feelings in all of life, in my opinion. When you're all alone, you have nobody to call, nobody to talk to. Nobody to rely on, 
Nobody to ask advice or suggestions or what do you think I should do? I once knew a guy who had this open position and he'd been doing what he'd been doing for about seven years. He had this position come open and, and these people called him and they wanted him for a job and they called him and they needed to know right now, are you coming or not? This was something that he wanted to talk to his dad about. He wanted to talk to his friends about, but he needed to answer him right away. He just felt so alone. That terrible feeling of being alone. Jesus is all alone as he endures these things at the hands of these sinners, these Gentiles. Let's start to look at this. And they led Jesus away. So what had just happened? What did we study last week? Do you remember what we studied last week? Jesus in the garden. He's trying to pray. Peter, James, John fall asleep. Kind of makes him mad. He says, can't you guys just stay up for a little bit with me and pray? They go, they start to leave, and Judas Iscariot shows up. They show up like they're taking a thief or a robber away. They show up with their clubs and their swords. Judas betrays him with a kiss. They take him, they handcuff him, they lead him away. And this is what they do with him. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were the, assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Jesus is going to stand trial why? Why is Jesus going to stand trial? What did he do wrong? Does anybody think of anything that he did wrong? What did he do wrong? Nothing. He did nothing wrong. Peter followed him at a distance. Remember earlier it had said that everybody forsook him and they all fled, but Peter's going to now come back. He's going to follow him at a distance. He doesn't want to be too associated with him. Right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Peter's got a front row seat of all that's happening here. Now the chief priests and the council sought testimony against Jesus. So he's been delivered, and now that he's delivered, he's going to stand trial before these people. The Bible explains to us six different trials that Jesus is going to face before different people. We don't look at all of them in this section because later on in chapter 15, he's going to stand before Pilate for another trial. So we're only looking at some of the six trials He's going to stand before the chief priests and all the council. Sought, they sought testimony against Jesus. How can we condemn this man? They've been, they've been looking for ways to get Jesus in front of them like this for a long time now. As we've studied Mark, they thought a long time ago that they couldn't wait to get their hands on him, to kill him, to get rid of him. They couldn't stand him. They couldn't stand the publicity that he was getting. They couldn't stand that he could do things that they couldn't do. They saw themselves as the administrators of truth and justice for the people, for God. And Jesus comes along and he ruins it all for them. And out of their envy, they decide they just need to kill him. They can't have this anymore. And they got him. They got him. Now they got him. Now they're rubbing their hands. You ever see, remember when we would put uh, hand sanitizer on our hands in 2012 or 2020 and we just, everybody would use hand sanitizer. Do you remember that? Or is that just me? Maggie, you got to remember this. When at the store, remember everybody would do that all the time. That's what they were like. Because that's what I always thought of when anybody would use hand sanitizer. It's like, what are you up to? Nothing. I'm just putting hand sanitizer on. Jerry, you're up to something. These chief priests, these scribes, the Sanhedrin, they got Jesus. And oh boy, what are we going to get him on now? We just can't wait to get him. He got delivered all alone to these guys. There is nobody to help him. There's nobody to talk to. Nothing. He is all by himself. And they're going to try to drum something up on him. They're going to make it up if they have to, because they can't find anybody. Many bore false witnesses against him, and their testimonies didn't even agree. They're trying everything they can do to get some kind of dirt on Jesus, but they can't find anything. They can't even make anything up, because, you know, when you lie about stuff, sometimes stories don't always line up. This is how police try to figure out who's lying and different things. It's like, well, this story doesn't line up, because, you know, when... These guys are lying. They're trying to make stuff up. Nothing is sticking. And some rose up and bore false witnesses of him saying, and now this is the one thing they can try to think about. 
We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another without hands. Now this is a reference back to early on, like in the ministry of Jesus. Like this is early on in the book of John, actually, where you can read about this. This was a long time ago. Who even remembers this stuff? Somebody did. It's because for this long, they've been trying to stick him with this. And they finally got him. But even all their testimonies didn't agree. In spite of all of their efforts, in spite of all of the time, in spite of everything they're trying to do, they got him, they got him cornered, they got him all alone, and they're like, all right, let's get him. They can't find anything against him. This is how pure and chaste Jesus was. This is how clean he was. You can't even make stuff up against him. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? In other words, do you have anything to say for yourself? We got all these people who want nothing more than to bust you up. You don't have anything to say? Nothing? But he kept silent. Just like this. He wasn't going to give him the time of day, was he? Again, the high priest asked him, saying, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Point blank asked him the, the, the hot button question. And Jesus finally answers, I am. Isn't it interesting that he uses the word I am? As you recall, in another place, Jesus says, I am. And they try to throw stones at him at that time. You remember that in the Gospel of John? And when he gets asked, are you the Christ? What's his answer? I am. He just, oh, don't you just love Jesus? He gets them. I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus, in spite of all of this garbage getting thrown at him, these false witnesses being all alone, all the disciples having fled, Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, having betrayed him. This is still very fresh in his mind. It's not like this is a year later after this betrayal of Judas Iscariot. This is the same night or morning. It's probably turning morning by now. <laughs> Hasn't slept yet. That's how soon this has happened. We have the Passover. We've got the betrayal. This is still very fresh in his mind. And when the high priest heard this, he tore his clothes. So not only was Jesus delivered to them so that they could trump up these charges and try to come up with something against him, and they think they've got something, they try to question Jesus, he answers them nothing, he asks them the pointed question, and Jesus says, I am. The high priest loses it. He tears off his clothes as if to say, I just... I'm going to wash my hands of this guy like I'm done with you. If, you're, if this is the kind of hardball you're going to play with me, Jesus, you know, you ever see like a hockey match and they got their gloves on and all of a sudden when the gloves come off, it's time. High priest, the gloves came down. It's time. They're done. No more Mr. Nice Guy from these high priests. You think they were bad before when he first was delivered to them? You just watch and wait and see what they do to Jesus now. And this ain't even the worst of it. Jesus is disgraced in a really, really, really bad way. The high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do you have of witnesses? In other words, Jesus has just implicated himself in such a terrible way. I don't even need you guys anymore. His own words, Jesus' own words have implicated him so harshly. I don't need these witnesses anymore. This man blasphemes the name of God. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. They're going to get him on the charge of blasphemy. Now, if there was a charge that was deserving of death, it would be blasphemy. But guys, did Jesus commit blasphemy? The answer is no, guys. The answer is no. 
He did not commit blasphemy because he is indeed the I am. His testimony is true. He is the I am. He is allowed to say that because it's true, but they don't believe it. They are going to continue with this trial. They're going to continue with the path they're going down with him. It's not enough that they've delivered him to these trumped up charges, but they're going to take it another step further here. They all condemned him to be deserving of death. And then some began to spit on him. Can you imagine our Lord Jesus the night he was betrayed, having to stand before these clowns, facing these trumped up charges that we all know are not true, and all by himself as the Son of God, who, as he said before, he could call down legions of angels and take care of this whole, this whole mess, allows himself to go through and endure all that it is that these sinful people are going to put him through. He allows all of what's going to happen. They spit on him. You ever spat on anybody before? Why would you spit on somebody? You'd really have to not like somebody to spit on them. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to really not like them. I mean, even today in our culture and in our society, we view getting spit upon as a terrible offense, especially with Corona now, right? What a terrible offense to get spat upon. And some began to spit on him, to blindfold him. Why would they blindfold him? Means of torture. They are, they are going to make short work of this Jesus guy. And they're going to make it miserable for him. You know, it's not enough that they spit on him and beat him up a little bit and rough him up. They got to blindfold him first. You ever, get, you ever get beat up being blindfolded? Who even does that anymore? But they blindfolded him so that they, he couldn't even defend himself. You know, at least if you're going to get hit, you might, you know, do this. But if you're blindfolded, you don't even know to do that. You just have to take it. They blindfolded him so that the beating and the roughing up they're going to do to him, he can't even defend himself. Why would he do this? Why would he allow himself to go through this? You'd think as Jesus, he could just, you know, Superman out of this thing and be done with it. Why does he allow himself to be treated like this? They spit on him, they blindfold him, and they beat him. And they mock him. They say, prophesy. In another place, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? Mocking him. And they struck him with the palms of their hands. Pow. Can you even imagine your Lord and Savior going through this kind of torment? And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. We ain't seen nothing yet. This is, this is, this is, this is the easy stage right now. We ain't seen nothing yet. The beatings that Jesus will end up enduring and suffering through before he finally gets killed are awful. I'm sure we'll read more about it as we go through. From having to carry the cross on his back <clears throat> becomes so heavy that they have to have somebody else do it. The book of Isaiah will tell us that his beard gets pulled out. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'll get like a, like when I'm shaving and I miss a hair or two and it's like rats. So I get the tweezer out and I'll get like the, the hairs that I couldn't get, you know, trying to groom myself. Some of those really hurt. You're probably like, oh, you big baby. Well, they do hurt sometimes. I can't imagine having handfuls of my beard ripped out. 
Can you even begin to imagine that? The crown of thorns that gets put on his head. He willingly allows himself to endure all of this disgrace. And as we go through this, as we go through next week, as we get through the cross in the coming weeks, this is the question that I want you to try to answer in your own mind. Why does Jesus allow himself to endure all of this stuff? Why? Why does he allow it? Why can't we just go right to the cross and be done with it? I want you to think about that over the next two or three weeks as we go through the end of Mark. Why does Jesus allow himself to endure this, to go all alone and endure these things? Not only to be delivered to these guys, but be disgraced by these guys. And now, kind of the, the, the aptly put slap in the face, Peter's denial. Verse 66, now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you are also with Jesus of Nazareth. Why didn't he just say, yeah? What, did he think he was going to get brought in there too? Did he get scared? Did he think lying was the appropriate response? He must have, because he did. Some of us, when we are put into different positions, maybe at work, maybe somebody will say something at work and we just kind of, you know, we don't say anything. We don't want to look like the person, the, the funny guy that's with Jesus. So we just kind of stand there and just kind of hope that nobody notices me. Is that what Peter was doing? Have you ever done that? I've done that. I've been Peter before. Have you? I bet you have. I bet you've been Peter before. Here we are thinking Peter's just a big dummy. Oh, you're just sitting there by the fire warming yourself. You could have gone in and helped him. You were standing right there. You've been Peter before too. So before we get too mad about what Peter's doing here, uh, let's, pull the, let's pull the piece out of our own eye first before we start thinking about how dumb Peter is. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out to the porch and a rooster crowed. It didn't dawn on him, the rooster's crowing, hello, nothing, Peter, nothing yet. No, nope, nothing yet. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them, but he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of those for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. So there was some sort of accent that Peter must have had as a Galilean that was associated with Jesus. Come on, Peter, we're on to you. You don't have to lie. You don't have to say something. I mean, we already know. You know, when you shine your light for Jesus, it should be unmistakable, like having a Galilean accent. We all know that you're with Jesus. You know, when I'm at work, everybody knows that you're with Jesus. So when somebody says something really bad, me standing there and not like, you know, I'm not helping. We all know that you're with Jesus, so you might as well just say so. Shine your light, guys and gals. Shine your light. Do what you're supposed to do. Stand up for truth. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for God. Stand up for the word. Stand up for righteousness. Shine your light. Right, Jeff? Sir. Shine your light. Don't be a Peter. We've all been Peter before in the past. And we can practice forgiveness with one another very easily for all being Peters. But don't be a Peter again. If you need to stand up for Jesus, if there's something that you can do to, to, to defend him or talk about him or, or shine your light for him, guys, my challenge for you is this. Don't allow Jesus to be all alone. 
if you truly understood how awful it is to be alone, and I suspect we do, don't allow Jesus to be in that position when you could just as easily stand up for him in so many different areas of life. Let your light shine before people so that they know who you are with. And don't lie about it. Because we all know where we stand. Your speech shows it, Peter. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. Peter, you're not getting out of it. Why do we think we can get ourselves out of these binds and you can swear and curse and you can hop up and down and you can get all excited about different things and just be honest, Peter. And a second time the rooster crowed and now, and now it's going to dawn on Peter. Oh yeah. Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And we thought about it. He wept. We are given opportunity after opportunity, open door after open door, every single day to be a light for Jesus, to spend time with Jesus. He waits for us every morning to come and spend time with him. How many mornings over this last week was he all alone because you didn't go to visit with him? How many nights over this last week was Jesus all alone? Because you didn't go to visit with him. If we truly understood how bad it is to be all alone, we'd be spending all the time we can with our Savior, who willingly, who willingly endured these things for you. He endured this stuff for you. And for me. And he did so willingly. The book of Hebrews tells us he willingly <coughs> endured all of this stuff. And he did it all alone. Because he loves you. Don't let him be all alone anymore. Let's pray.